Welcome to our weekly Real Wealth webinar. And I really appreciate you being here to talk about the fun stuff, taxes, while well, saving money on taxes. That's what makes it fun. Um, our guest today, Nathan Sosa from Hall CPA, the, the firm that we're using for our uh, single family rental fund and our build to rent syndication that we haven't haven't sent them the details yet because we're you know still uh, working on that and building it. But they, um, we've had a lot of questions from our investors and in syndications of, can they get the same tax treatment or better or the same as um, multifamily and how does that all work? So we thought instead of us trying to explain taxes, which we really shouldn't do, let's bring on the experts. We also have Paul DiVincenzo here with us uh, from Real Wealthy as our syndication manager. And actually in California today, because we are uh, speaking at an event tonight for LA Ria, we're excited about that. Um, so Paul has uh, worked very closely with Hall CPA to go over the distributions and the tax benefits to investors. So he's here too, to answer questions that he can address, um, mostly in regards to our syndication side. I'm Kathy Vetke, co-founder of Real Wealth, in case you didn't know, <laughs> I didn't say that. So today on the agenda, number one, we'll be talking about an understanding taxable income from real estate investments. Two, K-1 losses and depreciation and limitations to losses. Three, investment vehicles, self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end and do a quick overview of our available offerings, Wild Pine San Antonio, that's our build to rent community. Uh, we'll be talking throughout the presentation of how that particular project would be, um, you know, how you get tax benefits from that. So um, I do want to make sure people know that there are deadlines to these syndications and a lot of people wanted to get into our Oregon deal and that closed out last week. So um, there were a lot of disappointed people. I want to let you know that, that we are still taking investment for Wild Pine. Um, but there is a deadline, so don't wait too long and forget because this is a, a really a great one. And there it is. Uh, we're, we're building duplexes in uh, one of the top 10 fastest growing zip codes in the country in northwest San Antonio. Uh, these duplexes, I mean, they're beautiful. We just went there and toured recently with our whole Real Wealth team. We had our retreat there and did a property tour. If you haven't been to San Antonio or seen the Riverwalk, it is so beautiful, so fun. Um, and the area is just growing like crazy. This is a view of the land um, that we already have under contract where these properties will be built. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that syndication at the end. But let's talk about how you can save money and be able to invest in your future by saving on, on your taxes. So Nathan, welcome. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me on today. I'm super excited, which not everybody is always excited to talk about this, but it's fun to talk about the tax savings, right? At least on that standpoint. So I love that you're up, excited about it. That's, it's just like you're <laughs> in the right place. <laughs> well, hopefully we can find ways for people to take advantage of these tax savings, and at least plan for their futures and doing that. So to start with that, we have to understand exactly how taxable income from real investment, real estate investments work, right? So there's a lot of different ways. So a lot of times you can do, you can go out and purchase a single family property yourself, rent it out, et cetera. You can go through that. Or you can work with experts in this example who, who run syndications, who do these kinds of things, who know how to make deals and invest with them by using some of your cash and letting them utilize it, right? And so there is still differences on how those operate. They can be similar, but there's definitely differences. So allocating taxable income is the first thing we're going to hit on here. And that's where real estate syndications. So they're typically formed as LLCs, LPs slash LLPs. Basically, they're going to be partnerships, just like the, the San Antonio deal that they'll be talking about today. It's going to be an LLC. So basically, it's going to be taxed as a partnership. Now, what does that mean from a tax perspective? What that means is that it's a partnership is a flow through taxation which means that the income, profits, losses, gains, deductions, and there's all different kinds of those, are all gonna be allocated in accordance with an LLC operating agreement. And it's gonna get passed out to you via what's called a Form K-1. And I've got some examples, we'll talk about how that looks, and what that looks like essentially. But essentially, it's gonna pass out to everyone, and that's like whatever your share is, that's what you're going to receive from an income or a loss perspective. Now, 
There's a code section called 704B that di dictates specifically what allocations are allowed or disallowed. And there's something called substantial economic effect that also has to be followed with these operating agreements. And that's why a lot of times, like it's something that can be misunderstood by CPAs and even sponsors. But typically if you're working with a, well ta with a good tax advisor, they're gonna know and they're gonna be able to allocate these deductions and do them properly. And so what happens is like, you'll get the, your income or loss and deductions, gains, whatever that perspective, and then you report those on your personal tax return. So what does that look like? So this, if you can see here, this is an example of a Schedule K-1. And the Schedule K-1 basically will state that you're going to have, so up here is going to be the partnership name, which would be the San Antonio Pine is this, for this specific example. And then your partnership, your name investment would be right, would be lining up right there in that other, that, that second highlight. To the right, that's where all the income, all the losses are gonna get reported. In this example, there's a loss that's sitting there right now. And we'll talk about why a loss from a tax perspective is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. And actually, so like there's a difference between economic and tax losses. But in this example, you have a tax, so you got $10,000 tax loss from your investment. Let's say you've got 10%. Now it's gonna be hard for most of you to get 10%, but it's like 10% is a pretty, pretty good check just for this kind of example. Then, got a million dollars of what we call debt, right? That's your share of the liabilities from the syndication overall. That's very important for what we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. Also, then if you look right below that, that is your partner's capital account. This is incredibly important from a tax perspective. This is what tells you how much income, how much loss, how many distributions, how, many, how much you put into the syndication overall. This is where all of that gets reported over the life cycle of the LLC and the syndication. So you can see there's a capital contributed line. So whatever you invest today or whatever you invest into San, into San Antonio Pine, that's what's going to show up in that line right there for capital contributed. Then whatever income gets re released from this year as well. So for this example, let's just say it's like $100,000. So $100,000 is going to be reported as a loss for a current year income for tax purposes. Then below that, there's going to be the distributions that you received throughout the entire tax year, right? And uh, we say tax year. These K-1s are always looking back in the past, right? I've got 2023 here, 2024, what the IRS has not yet released those forms, so that's why they're not here yet. But once those do get released, that's kind of how, that, like, it'll look very similar from that type of, from that perspective. And it will always, we're always playing behind when it comes to tax too. Because whenever we file a tax return, right, we'll file... 2024's tax return in 2025. So it'll just be a reporting of all the distributions you received from this indication over the entire year, which winds us up with our ending capital account, which in this example is a negative $10,000, which some of you will be like, oh, negative numbers, that's bad. Not necessarily, you can get to a negative capital account and that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Now we'll talk a little bit about tax basis, how that interplays here, but essentially not necessarily a bad thing just means that you wind up with negative negative capital account because you put in you put in cash you took a loss you took distributions and so basically at, at the at the end of all of that you now have a, a negative capital account so we're talking about distributions right what's the impact of those how did they work well Many of us who invest in financial markets or anything of that nature, right? Whether that's Microsoft, John Deere, anything of that nature, you get dividends when you invest into a stock. And so you pay, you pay tax on the dividends that come from the stock. Now, that is not the same thing here. What I just explained there, that's a corporation. That's double taxation. And you receive dividends by investing into these large corporations or even private corporations as well. That is not how it works from a partnership perspective. Partnerships are a single taxation entity versus the corporation double taxation entity, which is more favorable. And the distributions received, while they're not taxable, they reduce what's called your basis in the LLC units. And that matters, and we'll talk about why that matters here in a little bit. But essentially, like I mentioned before, is that whenever the K-1s pass out to you, you will report the income and the distributions on your 1040 tax return. So whether or not you actually get a distribution, that income is still gonna be taxable to you, regardless of distribution or anything of that nature. So if you have income from a partnership, but you might not get cash, it still winds up being taxable. However, 
the benefit of this is that distributions from a partnership, like I said before, are tax-free actually, which is great. That means so if you get cash, you're not taxed on that. So a lot of things investors get mixed up. They, they think it's like pulling money out from Microsoft. It's like getting dividends, something like that. And it's not actually at all. If you get $10,000 of distributions from a partnership, that's not taxable to you. Now, there are always exceptions. There's always caveats in tax, right? It's never, unfortunately, straightforward the way our current tax law is written. So there are exceptions. If you don't have, if you have insufficient tax basis, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. If you have large debt finance distributions, or even some instances where a general partner guarantees a debt, those are the exceptions to this rule. But a lot of times, like I said, they're exceptions. They're not the general rule in this instance. For most LP investors, you're going to get your distributions tax-free more times than not, which is fantastic for you because you're not going to be taxed on that. That's not something that you got. You got a cash, a tax-free cash distribution. Now, an example for liability allocations on the next page, because it's really important how this works and why you get the opportunity to take to get these cash, these these cash distributions tax-free. So, in the initial example that I brought up, it's where you have negative $10,000 ending capital account, right? And so we talked about negative numbers might seem bad, but not necessarily. So we've got negative $10,000 ending capital. And then if you look right above that, you'll see you've, there are ending liabilities here in this example. And what that means is that you combine these two numbers to figure out what your tax basis is. And so now you've ended in a positive tax basis, which means there was sufficient tax basis to take that distribution tax-free which is wonderful, right? So that means you're not taxed, you don't have to pay anything else, no phantom income, it's fantastic, right? So you get to recognize that even though you got a loss, there's a loss that came from the K-1, and then additionally, you got to take, you got cash that wasn't taxed to you. Fantastic. You get, you get off almost scot-free. Now, what happens, what would happen if you got a taxable distribution? Now, I, I don't expect the situation to come up, but it's good to know just in case something like this ever happens. And so you're not caught unawares. A lot of times investors might be caught unawares when these special situations come up. So if you have ending capital, let's say again, negative $10,000, but you have zero ending, ending liabilities, right? So you've got now an ending quote unquote negative basis. So now that $10,000 distribution, that does become a capital gain to you if it happens in the first year. Now, if it doesn't, now if it's later on, if it happens year three, four, five, that winds up being a long-term capital gain. So long-term capital gains taxed at the max 23.8%, while short-term are ordinary. But again, this is like a very nuanced situation. I just want other people to be aware because they happen, but they don't happen that frequently. So K-1 losses and depreciation. Now this is super important to talk about in the scope of real estate just in general. And the reason this is, is because losses are not bad for tax purposes. They're actually fantastic for tax purposes. Why? Because they help us reduce our taxable income, help us pay less taxes to the government. Fantastic, right? So you, I like to like think about this as an investor myself. It's like, hey, if I get a refund from the government because of my real estate investment, it's an extra cash on cash return, right? So whatever I got from the investment, plus I get, I get a tax-free loan from the government, it's an additional cash that I wasn't expecting. That's great. It means I got a better return on my investment in this instance. And so that's why there's a big difference between paper losses and economic losses. So paper losses from a tax perspective come more times than not from depreciation. Now there are a lot of other caveats, a lot of other things that get, that get involved and play into effect here, but more times than not, it comes from depreciation, especially in real estate. And so paper losses are always, are always eventually recaptured unless the asset is held until death. And that's where we get the step of a death. A lot of people, believe in the mantra of swap till you drop, where you do 1031, things of that nature until the end, and then you get to get the step up basis, your inheritors then get to decide what they want to do with the assets, but it's their choice and their time, no tax effect for them. However, in a real estate syndication, K-1 losses, very typical, especially in the first year of operations, right? And that comes from, again, depreciation. And so what is depreciation, right? Well, depreciation is essentially the IRS says, or the, the tax code says, and the IRS interprets, says that, okay, so this building that is like, look, it's going to wear and tear over time, right? And we can't really give a deduction for that, right? We can't, there's no easy way to figure that. So they just go, hey, here is an outline of assets we think that fall into these specific categories. And buildings fall specifically into a 27 and a half or 39 year type of depreciation. And they say, well, 
the building's going to wear and tear. So you're going to take straight line depreciation over the course of X, Y, Z, over, over the course of X, Y, Z years. And so what that means essentially is even though you're getting a paper loss, right? There's no cash outlay, right? Utilities is an expense that reduces taxable income too, but there's a cash outlay for that that reduces your net, your net margins while depreciation is not. It's essentially a paper loss like I've been stating. And so that allows you to totally take the, that allows you basically to not to keep more of your cash while get depreciation. And what's even better is real estate appreciates actually. So even though we're getting deductions from a tax perspective, we're getting, de we're getting deductions for an appreciating asset, which means we're getting more value from a tax and investment perspective too. Now, the one caveat to make with that is that losses may not be utilized immediately by investors. And the reason that is, is because of passive losses. And we'll get to that a little bit more on depreciation. It's like one thing to mention as well is cost segregation studies. So cost segregation studies are typically performed by the syndicator and they then allow, basically they go, they look inside the building and they say, okay, the teams of engineers, the people of that nature come out and they say, well, these assets here, they're going to wear and tear significantly faster than components of the building structure, right? The actual framing, the actual security systems, those types of items, those are depreciated over a much longer life cycle. While some items like countertops, cabinets, stuff like that, those get depreciated at five or 15 years over time. So that's how the cost, so the cost seg will wind up pulling those out. And now you get to take even, you get to take accelerated depreciation, right? Because five and 15 years is way faster than 27 and a half or 39. And also you will get to take in certain situations, bonus depreciation or section 179 on these types of on these types of assets which means it's a large immediate expense versus getting the depreciation over time so you get a larger loss year one versus later years without the bonus or section 179 deductions now right now 2024 anything that gets quoted what we call placed in service is going to get a 60 percent bonus depreciation threshold now 2025 drops to 40 percent Granted, we did just have an election, and I think it's very likely that 40% is not gonna be the 2025 bonus depreciation threshold that we, run, we, we wind up running into. I truly think that it'll increase in some form or fashion. To what exactly? I don't know. I know Congress and new elected President Donald Trump really would like to bring back immediate expensing, bring back 100% bonus depreciation that we had 2022 and years prior. We'll see what happens, but it's definitely on the table and something that's going to be considered for anything that gets placed in service in 2025 later down the road. Now, talking additionally talking about that is the recapture upon sale impacting capital gains. So when you do these cost segregation studies, right now, everything, if it like upon a sale, everything will be taxed essentially at capital gains rate, which is a max of 23.8%. However, when we reclass these assets into five 15 year buckets which we call quote unquote 1245 assets which 1245 assets just basically means hey yeah this is going to get depreciated way faster than the bigger bigger ticket items now the ira the tax code says great you get an ordinary deduction today however tomorrow you have to you have to have ordinary income basically so they basically should say hey you can take your tax-free loan today from the government just know that down the road, you may or may not have to pay this back to some aspect. There's a lot of things that go into play on like how that gets calculated, how that winds up working, but it does happen eventually. So just think of, but the best way to think of it, in my opinion, is think of it as a tax-free loan the government's giving to you today so that you can utilize, invest, take advantage of, a majority, take advantage of that to utilize your investments as much as possible. Now, the loss limitation rules, right? So a lot of you've heard this, been thinking about, great, I'm gonna get tons of depreciation, I'm gonna get tons of tax savings, that's fantastic. There are additional limitations to consider on that piece. And that's the passive activity loss rules. And so there's basically, there's limits against non-passive income for non, non material participating real estate professionals. And, and what that basically means is that like real estate professionals, who, that, that is those who spend 750 hours in a real property trader business and spend more than 50% of their time working in the real property trader business, that means they might have a chance to they can over they might have a chance to qual to flip these this these losses into passive losses. 
into non-passive losses. And so that, the, that would allow those losses to offset other forms of business income, W-2 income even, right? Unfortunately, that means a lot of those who are entrepreneurs, who are running other businesses, who are high W-2 earners, might not be able to take advantage of these benefits right away. That does not ever mean you never can take advantage of them. It just means that you might not get taken in the year they are incurred, right? So if you get losses in 2025 from it from the syndication, that just means you might not get to utilize them right then and there. Now, with that, you do get to utilize the losses later down the road. Once the property does sell, those losses get what we call get released and they actually get to offset your ordinary income when that sale occurs. So that's what's a fantastic benefit is that like so long ago when you had a lot of those losses, that means now you do get the benefit once the property goes quote unquote full cycle a lot of times. And so now you'll get the advantage to take advantage of the tax benefits and allow get some tax savings for yourself. Now it's not today, but it could be down the road unless you do qualify for rep for real estate professional status or and you will be able to pull these in. Now, there are other limitations when it comes to material participation and participating in a syndication or having other options to make this happen. Definitely, but like a lot of complexity that goes into effect there, but it is possible. It's not impossible whatsoever. Definitely something that can be utilized or looked at if you qualify for reps. There are other business basis limitations too. Honestly, don't see this happen all that often with real estate because so much real estate is very tax favored. And so you get to take a lot of losses. There are at-risk limitations. Now, that's basically, there's a lot of what we call non-recourse debt in a syndication. That basically is like debt no one's on the hook for, right? Is that essentially, that, that's what that means. Now, granted, real estate is carved out specifically into what we call qualified non-recourse debt. And essentially what that means, any debt that's associated with real estate is going to be able to increase your tax basis and let you take these losses. So that's fantastic. Now there is something else that was brought into effect in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act called the Excess Business limit Loss Limitations. And so what that means is a $610,000 limit that you can take for losses. Basically the, the government just says, yeah, you used to be able to take all of these losses. Sorry, we're gonna limit you on how much you can do from here on out. And so there's a limit there. It does increase with inflation each year uh a lot but like this is something that you should be talking with your tax advisor or if you need a tax advisor to work with like to have have these kinds of discussions to plan around these kinds of things if you think they're going to if they think they're going to wind up affecting you so long and short of this overall is that maybe a lot of the, a lot of lp investors don't get to take advantage of the depreciation benefits today that doesn't mean that down the road they won't get to take advantage of them additionally uh, something I haven't mentioned yet is if you have other passive investments, right? Other investments that you've invested in that maybe are going like other other syndications that are selling or are producing taxable income for you. You can utilize these losses today to offset that type of income, actually, which is really great because that means you are basically like I think about it is that we have two buckets of income. We have the active and we have the passive. So the active things that you're currently doing, operating, et cetera, all day in, passive is what you are putting your money into and you setting and forgetting, not thinking about. So if you have taxable income coming from other passive investments, syndication losses can help you offset in this instance, actually. It's really fantastic. And so that would also be another way you can utilize this before the property fully goes full cycle and might sell at the end of the day. Now, there are multiple investment vehicles out there to consider. There are self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks. Now, what's great about these is a lot of people have made these types of, who've made investments and have put significant capital into IRAs and solo 401ks as investors. This actually gives you a lot more access to capital to, without needing to withdraw retirement funds, right? It's like a lot of times people want to use this cash. They put it in there and like, it turns out you can't use it till 55 in some circumstances, 59 and a half most of the time. It feels locked. It feels like cash that's locked away from you. And a lot of people who are like, man, I'm really diversified in financial markets. I'd like to get more into real estate for my retirement. I really would like to do this or that. I just want like, feel like that money is trapped. If you're a self-directed IRA, invest, if you, if you have a self-directed IRA, you can invest in these kinds of syndications with that cash actually. So you can dilute some of your financial market interest and invest into real estate through syndications. It is very much is open to you and is possible. And if you do this, if it's unleveraged rental income and gains, it could be, it would be non-taxable actually. 
solo 401k, all rental income and all gains would be non-taxable, right? Same thing with solo 401k. So if you have rolled a 401k into a solo from an old retirement account, or if you've wound up, if you if you are running a business and you have your own solo 401k, it's another way for you to continue investing in real estate. But there are, as always, like I've said many times before, it's like there are always caveats to these kinds of things. And so essentially, like I, I specifically mentioned the unleveraged rental income. There is something called unrelated, unrelated debt financed income and unrelated business tax, unrelated taxable business income. And what these provisions are, I'll, I'll talk about unrelated debt financed income first is that like this could be a potential pitfall. And like I say pitfall, like this is not something that's not meant to like say, hey, you can't do this type of thing or you shouldn't do this. It's just saying something to be cognizant, to be aware of, just like a lot of those basis limitations we talked about. They might not apply to every single investor, but being aware of them makes you cognizant, makes you a, a savvy investor so that you're not caught unaware from these things or you can plan out and plan for these types of events if they may or may not happen. So the unrelated debt financed income what this basically means is that like if there is income coming from a property and it has taxable income associated with it what that means is now that you have to file a separate tax return generally called like a 5500 it's basically your pension tax return for your ira and say hey you have to now pay tax on that income now granted most times like we've mentioned times before in real estate, you're not going to have taxable income coming from real estate. Real estate does not, because of depreciation, you're not going to wind up having this kind, uh, you're not going to have to do this. It's just something that is out there. So you got to be aware of this piece. So that way you're not cut unawares because the taxable income does not is not going to be produced because depreciation offsets rental income along with all the other expenses. So you're going to wind up not having to be assessed with this tax, but it is something to be aware of when it may or may not happen because of the because if it's if there's le debt leverage on the property it could wind up occurring to you unrelated business income taxable unrelated tax taxable business income is if hey if you've got taxable income in a 401 a, a 401k an ira then that could wind up being taxable to you again now solo 401ks are actually really ad ad advantageous for this because they don't have to worry about the unleveraged debt financed income. They are exempted from that piece. And so that's why actually it's a little bit safe, not only say safer, but it's a little bit easier to invest in those types of investments. Now, pitfall to me personally that I see a lot of times with this is these, if you invest with a, a self-directed IRA or a solo 401k, those losses do not offset your personal income. So you do not get to take advantage of the tax benefits in this instance, right? So essentially what that winds up meaning is that if you're hoping to take advantage of the tax benefits, if you want to do this, then you might not want to use a self-directed IRA or a solo 401k in this instance. You might actually want to do this personally through, through your name, through disregarded entity, something of that nature, instead of this. Now, if you have capital and you would like to, to leverage or diversify your portfolio, this might be a wonderful option for you. Just know that there's always I want to say there are always pitfalls and always things that might require to that, that might happen in certain situations for you. So there could be administrative costs as well, because sometimes you have to file that 5500, that, that tax return 5500 that is for the IRA that would have to happen if there was taxable income. Doesn't always happen. It's just something we like to have our investors be aware of so they don't run afoul of those types of rules. So just the FYI on the pitfalls of SDAs, SDIRAs, and solo 401ks there. And if you guys want to learn more about us, um, we're always taking on new clients. Um, you can use, click the link, the go like realestate.com CPA link. Uh, I, I post content on LinkedIn and website X pretty frequently. We also have a podcast, TaxMart REI, that is published every Tuesday. We also have a community called TaxMart REI as well. That's a lot of real estate investors who come in, post. We have master classes and other just classes, Q and A's for other investors to ask about taxes or ask questions. So if there's other ways you want to get connected with us, where that's those are those are some of the many ways. Thank you so much. We've got a couple of questions, if that's all right. Absolutely, we'd love that. 
So somebody asked, when are K-1 documents sent out? I assume they're talking to, I, I'm not sure which fund or syndication they're talking about, but typically yeah. when does that happen? Yeah, it's a great question. So typically, uh, it's, so generally it, it depends on, I like that's something I would always talk with the syndicator about, is like when they're sent out. They have to be sent, they are technically due by March 15th of the following tax year. So that would be March, so that'd be March 15th, 2025 of this year. Um, that's typically when they're sent out. Now, if that, fall, if that falls on a weekend, because I actually don't know what date that is specifically, it would be the next following Monday, assuming it's not a federal holiday, because sometimes that happens too. But it basically, that's the first date. Now, sometimes syndications do require an extension. And so they, they would then be extended to 915 of 2025. Now, that's like that's something to always talk with your syndicator about is saying, hey, when do you guys expect to have the tax return filed, have documents ready? So generally, March is the time frame this, these get done. So that's generally when you expect to get your K-1s and then you can file your tax return before 415 of April. Yeah, it seems like in our experience, especially if it's a fund to fund where you're waiting for the K-1 from the umbrella group, it, it's going to be extended mm -hmm. in general. Yeah, it happens a lot. I've also heard that it's almost better to give the syndicator that time till September because not all the numbers have come in yet. Um, I mean, what's been your experience there? No, it's an excellent point. Like, it's an excellent point. Yeah, it's like a lot of times, like it's better like extensions are not bad things right they don't require they like they don't increase your audit chance if you have to make an extension on your personal tax return because you're waiting on a k1 this by no means does that increase an audit or anything of that nature there's a lot of bad information out there sometimes that state that the only thing that i, I want people to be cognizant of is that your tax liability is due for 15. so that's something that like hey is like once you know a lot of people who have w2s you're paid in you're fine but I think extensions are great because it gives everyone more time. Like, like you're just saying, Kathy is like more ability to get 100% better financials, gives the tax preparers the ability as well to fully analyze the situation. And that gives them the opportunity to say, hey, we might want to make this election, make that election, make talk about making decisions with the syndicators so that the LPs have their positions and their tax, their tax statuses the most optimized, right? That's always our goal in that piece. So that gives everybody a chance to have the most accurate numbers and the most accurate tax position. Yeah, that's, uh, is it true that um, there's l almost less chance of an audit if you file an extension? Because I hear that uh, a lot. I, I've, I've, I've heard that. Um, I don't like, I don't know if that's necessarily true. It's it's hard to say exactly what causes the IRS to trigger what, what doesn't, right? I'll tell you the th number one thing that will cause you to get an audit is if you forget to file one of your tax forms, right? So if you go through and you file and like you got a, you don't file one of your W-2s, you're gonna get a notice from the IRS, right? Like that's 100% gonna happen. Now, sometimes if you extend, does that decrease your audit chance? Some much people might say yes, some people might say no. I, I think it's kind of hard to actually pin that down and say yes or no to that question. Yeah, okay, well we we personally always file an extension because that does give more time to talk to your CPA. Totally. They're so busy until April, and then you kind of, then they go on vacation, so then you get to really have that conversation and make sure you're filing properly because actually having to resubmit or having an error is worse, right? Then you really get flagged. Yeah, significantly, yeah, that's like, it's a great point. Significantly worse to have to go do that because you might be able to do what's called a superseding return and if it's within the same tax year, but if that's that for some reason that opportunity is not available to you, there's a really gross process that you have to do to go back and amend and basically it really causes a lot of pain for everyone. So it's always best to get everything right the first time. So having extensions more times than not is way more beneficial. And I would say, I think, 80% of tax returns are extended actually. So like, it's actually a very small minority of people who wind up not extending on their returns. Okay, another question was, um, the amount of loss is based on your tax bracket, right? At, if 35% tax bracket is your example of a 10K loss saves 3,500, not the whole 10,000, right? Oh, so yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it's very interesting. It's like, we have a bracket, we have a tax, we have a bracketed system here in the United States. So a lot of times you can look at two different, there's two different ways to look at your tax, at your overall tax liability and what can produce tax savings. There's an effective tax rate, which will be the average overall of the tax brackets increase, et cetera, and like the tax percentage. There's also the marginal tax rate. So if you're sitting at $500,000 of taxable income at the end of the year, you're going to get taxed at 35%. And so any dollars that are produced to reduce your income at 
in that tax bracket. So it's a $10,000 loss, right? That's not going to push you out of the 35% bracket. So your example would be correct. That would be $3,500 of tax savings from that example. Now, as I could say, like it's, it is bracketed. So at some point, like you might, like dollars become less, right? So some people are in 12% tax bracket and those dollars are not as valuable as 35% up top. But so yeah, your example is correct. Like if you're the loss, if you can take it, if you're not passive or you're not a real estate, or if you're a real estate professional, you would get to absorb the losses there. Okay. Uh, I have a real estate professional status. My wife and I re recently set up separate revocable living trusts. Can Nathan recommend better ways to invest or not invest, i.e. directly via our individual trusts or just my trust via an LLC under a trust? Does it, that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I understand what you're saying there. Um, so like what I like, so LLCs, that's like, honestly, more times than not, that, that, that's not a question you should have with an attorney because it's more of a legal, legal liability protection type of thing. There's not a whole lot, like if you're, if you invest, in a revocable living trust or through an LL, a single member LLC doesn't really do anything from a tax perspective. The only time like LLCs and those types of entities more times than not are just used for limiting your liability, right? It's like it's it's in the name. So it's like the way it sounds like to me you set that up doesn't sound like it's gonna create any issues. Now what I will mention is if you create an LLC and you and you and your spouse are both 50-50 owners on that you will create a partnership filing tax, you, you have to tr you trigger a partnership tax return. So that means now you have to file your own partnership tax return with the K-1 that you receive, and then you have to report that K-1 to your personal tax return. It's pretty messy. So recommendation there is like just either A, don't do the single member LLC, or B, if you do that, have it be through a trust that you and your spouse own 50-50 together on, so then that's going to keep you from having to be to file this partnership tax return actually. That's what's advantageous to the on that piece because having extra tax returns, that's extra tax prep costs, right? So that's an extra it could be 500 bucks. I know it could be more expensive depending on like what kind of tax advisor you use. So always want to save and make things simple even, right? We don't need to have random partnership tax returns out there if there's no no need for them. Okay. When a grow developments or now it is real wealth developments project is ultimately sold and all capital returned to investors, can investors roll that into another real wealth developments project via 1031 to avoid the capital? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, no. You, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> I wish you could, but no, unfortunately, we can't take the, take advantage of 1031 with the partnership interest. Yeah, yeah. It's the it's a. I know there's ways that syndicators do it where they maybe mm -hmm. carve out a TIC. Tenants yes. in common within the yes. within the fund. We don't have that, so it's like kind in a 1031. Um, if we were to take the entire, Nathan, you confirm or not? But let's say in our San Antonio build to rent, we build, we sell, and the entire entity would like to 1031. Um, so we we just take the, all the investors with the same titling, and we just go do it again. You can do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they like if the if the entire syndication, right, gotta get the entire everyone's gotta got to say yes to this. That's the hard part is getting everyone to say, yeah, no. Yeah, right. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's the hard part. So it's like there's always it always ends up just being one or two people as well, right? It's never like a big show, it's just one or two people, and that unfortunately can ruin the entire thing. Um so yeah, sadly, no 1031 there unless you get everybody on board. So start making pitches to all the other investors. Okay, your PALS can result in zero taxable income in one year. However, you can still end up owing tax anyway if you're subject to alternative minimum tax. Are your PALS used in that year to make your taxable income zero gone and not usable in a future tax year? Okay, so passive activity, so they're talking about passive activity loss carry you forwards in that instance. <laughs> yeah, our, our PALS, yeah, that's funny. I didn't think of that like that. But yeah, passive activity loss carry forwards. Um, I on it so AMT hasn't really been an issue since 2018. Um, now granted, it is set to sun, it is set to come back in 20 at the end of 2025, unfortunately. Um, however, like uh, AMT is not really an issue as of right like as of right now. Like I've I've seen maybe two or three people, and that's not even in the real estate context, who have had to deal with um, AMT. So no, so like I, so I think unless I'm like and like like I said. 
every situation is different. So maybe there's something about your situation that I'm not always used to. But for the most part, tax activity losses should be able to help you reduce your income to zero and not have to pay tax. Beautiful. Okay, how can I tell if my K-1 losses are being utilized in later years to offset other taxable income? Great question. So what I would check, two different pages on your tax return. I would check Schedule E, page two. I would check that and look to see what, see what losses are coming through and what not. The second form I would always check is your form 8582. This is where passive activity losses should be tracked and, rip and show. So if you invested through syndicate, other syndications, K-1s, other rental properties even, that's where all those items are going to be tracked and show what's passive, what's not passive for you. And if they're being utilized, you should see, you should see, hey, I've got passive loss here, passive income on this side, and then they'll net each other on that form. And so you'll be able to see the reduction happening there. You'll also see on the 8582. I 100% recommend everyone consistently check this, especially if you've moved tax repairs at all in recent years. This is something I see get missed pretty frequently, actually, is that they don't pick up the carryovers. And so maybe you had a ton of passive losses, and then let's say a syndication sells, and so you know you have the resulting gain, but someone forgot to pick up the carryover on the new tax return. It can be missed, and that's a tax hit you shouldn't have to have. So like always recommend checking Schedule E, page two, and 8582 on those. Great. Uh, UBIT, very confusing. How do I know which syndications are subject to UBIT or not? Yeah, so it's, I mean, all real estate deals are subject to have some kind of leverage, right? So there's always going to be that and there's always going to be involved there. Essentially, and again, if you UBIT have, is unrelated business income tax on, on right, the self. Yeah, so, so this wouldn't even apply in a real estate syndication context, right? So like if you invested into an ATM fund or something of that nature, then that might apply to you. But from a Real estate perspective is not going to apply. That's just a that was just an FYI out there. But there's always leverage on real estate, but depreciation helps us minimize that, and so that basically creates no taxable income. So you're never going to have that. So if a K1 pops up and it's got taxable income and it's real estate and you invested into a solo, a self-directed IRA, just know that's when you're going to have to that's when you you are going to have to have that 5500 filed. I think we had, um, you know, some of our build syndications where we're just building um, homes and selling them. They're not built mm -hmm. to rent. They're built to yes. sell. So that's a business because mm -hmm. you are now partnering with the builder. You're not holding. That's where our investors have faced the UBIT because unrelated business income tax, you are an equity investor partnering with the builder. You basically get active, right? So then it would apply. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That in that example, right? Yeah. That would definitely like yeah. a lot of the build to rent structures, not UBIT doesn't apply, but if you are building to sell, definitely is going to apply in that instance. Um, and so that'd be cognizant of that piece then. So just always take your documents to your CPA to, to have them look at it because, you know, a lot of, again, it comes down to, is it a passive, are you a passive investor or are you active? And even though you're passive, cause you're just investing, you're not, thrown in hammers or you know you're not right. doing the work um it, it's still as if you're a partner in a business that's active so always show now on our san antonio deal which we'll we'll talk about i'll get to more of these questions in a bit but we'll go and look at this is a perfect segue to this this um build to rent in san antonio is very different than our other build projects because we are holding so it's going to be different so let's um let's go look at some of the next slides and then we'll answer more questions So this, this project is, is open now, um, just for a bit longer. Uh, it's Wild Pine San Antonio LLC. I talked about it in a bit. These are uh, a bit ago when we started. Let's go to the next slide to kind of give you some details on it, and then we can um, talk about the, I know, I know you already did, but sort of the tax benefits to this. We're building 56 units, 28 duplexes in northwest San Antonio. The, top 10 fastest growing zip code in the country. The area is just booming. Um, built, it's built, being built and managed by an experienced property team that we've worked with at Real Wealth. They're our most popular property team when people are just buying um, outright for themselves, building their portfolio, our San Antonio team. So we've you know, already been working with them. We're giving a 12% preferred return plus a 50% profit split after 100% um, of available distributable cash distributable cash goes to investors until they receive their adjusted capital and their preferred return. 
And uh, we're holding it five to six years, selling in year five or six when the project's fully stabilized, minimum investment of 50,000 and for accredited investors only, meaning that you either earn 200,000 as an individual or 300,000 um, as a couple, or you have a million dollar net worth or you have certain SEC security licenses. Um, let's go to the next slide so that you can comment, answer any questions. Paul, I'll hand this one to you. He meticulously underwrote this very conservatively. We have, uh, we know the risks to development and getting the timeline wrong or the construction costs wrong. So uh, he went through it line by line and can, uh, can tell you about this part. Yeah, so I'll roll through this fast so we get some, some questions. But uh, the land is 9.6 acres. We actually did just acquire it uh, a couple days ago. Uh, so it is purchased and we will be the only builder uh, on this community and in this community. Um, once the land is closed, we still need to get the construction loan in place. We do have uh, non-binding term sheets in place uh, from two different lenders right now. Uh, so again, we'll build 56 units, 20 duplexes. This will take over 36 to 40 months. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, that is being conservative. Um, the builder said you could probably do it faster, but putting a little wiggle room in that number. Uh, so it'll be phase one will be site work. Uh, phase two will be 14 duplexes. We will then start to lease out those 14 duplexes, and then we'll start on phase three of the remaining 14 duplexes. So by the end, when the 14 duplexes, the last duplex is finished, we should, will be finished all with construction and almost the lease up will be finishing at the same time. Uh, we were conservative in our lease up numbers. Uh, the vacancy rate in this area is around like four or 5%. Um, so it's very strong. The rental rates are coming in around $1.49 to $1.79 for three bedroom rentals. And we sort of put it on the lower end at $1.52. So that'll be $2,099 per month. You go to the next. Next slide. Uh, as I said, once we finish construction, we'll fully lease it up and properties fully stabilized. We then have to refinance out of construction loan. So we'll go to a permanent loan. Um, through sort of relationships, we'll look at Freddie or Fannie Mac loan, an insurance loan, or look at regional bank loan. So uh, we will then bring that to a probably a 30 year mortgage. Uh, we'll hold it then uh, for another year or two years. Uh, that allows actual expenses to come in and actual income. So when people are evaluating the deal, when they go to purchase it, they could see actual numbers, not just project projections. Um, our, we do have an exit strategy. So one, we could sell it off as a bulk portfolio sale to a larger institutional investor. Or the nice thing is the way we're setting this up, we could sell them off individually, um, one duplex at a time or in a bulk, um, smaller bulk sale. Uh, potentially as well. So it gives us a lot of flexibility on the sale and the exit strategy. You go. Uh, this is just the site I said uh, that we did acquire. You have single family homes um, surrounding it and a lot of class A multifamily um, in the area as well. And the freeway and access to the freeway is a couple minutes from this location. So this is again accredited investors only with third party verification because it's a 506C. We can accept IRA investment, minimum investment 50,000, minimum funding de deadline 1.5 million by December 15th, maximum funding 3.6 with uh, deadline January 31st. So the first deadline's coming up. Um, so Nathan, I, I know that uh, some people have some questions, so I'll I'll ask it. As a passive investor, all the expenses and depreciation could be deducted at my W-2 when it sells, right? Correct. This is 100% correct. Okay. Um, do you review and assess the optimization of previous year's tax returns for potential clients such that you can estimate how much more they could have gotten back? So can you look at people's tax returns and see if you could have done better? 
We do. Yeah, we do. We, we always go through. Uh, it's like part of our advice or the advisory piece that we offer at Hall CPA is you go, go looking back uh, at prior years to see what things we could have taken advantage of. Maybe we didn't. And also just ongoing planning, which is also significant, super important too. Does it help to register as an S Corp as an LLC? No, uh, with real estate, I'm going to say 99% of the time, no. <laughs> when it comes to like, especially investing in syndications, I like it's very unadvisable in my opinion. I would not recommend that. Um, there are situations, S Corps are fine. Real estate, very rarely is one of them. Okay. If we already invested in a syndication under a Roth IRA, is there any way to recategorize this to avoid future UDFI taxes? Uh, that's something I, I I would talk to your like who are like if someone helped you set it get it set up. Um, there are some ways that you can't like it, you might just be you might just want to keep it in there for now. Uh, like I mentioned, is that like as long as there's not going to be any taxable income, then you're going to be fine, right? It's just a potential pit, it's a potential pitfall, not a for sure going to happen type of pitfall. Uh, can I do a 1031 exchange into a syndication? We already said no, but what I didn't say is Real Wealth has been helping people with 1031s for 20 years. That's really our expertise. And I think we're really good at simplifying that process because it's daunting to sell a property and have to identify a new one in 45 days and close in, in um, you know, uh, six months, basically total. Mm -hmm. So uh, we that's the beauty of having these 15 teams around the country that have properties ready for you to identify. And our investment counselors will make sure that you identify enough um, because sometimes people just identify exactly what they need. And if one falls through, you're really in a bad situation. So I, I imagine, Nathan, that you guys help people with that, uh, you know, just press planning for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, has there been a capital call on a real wealth development? There have been, but we haven't um, passed that on to the investors. So um, on the Shasta Wine Village one, we just simply said no because we we were waiting for a pro forma to show that it would be it would make sense that we would not only get our money back but also the new money. Um, so if anyone asks for a capital call, you this is my opinion. Ask well some some syndications they require it right, um, and you kind of know about it up front. Uh, but in my opinion, always ask for how is this going to change the business plan? How is this going to help us? If we put more money, is it going to save the project or is it just more money I'm losing because you didn't show me how it's going to save it? Uh, we also had a capital call on um, Murata, the big 4,200 lots in um, Tampa that is a, just a huge development, got really difficult during COVID and we got behind. Um, our manager of that project, did the capital call himself. So he put it in as a loan. Uh, we have not gone to investors and asked for more, more money. And in our documents, I, we just don't do it. We don't, uh, I, I, think, I think it depends on the project. But Nathan, have you seen situations where a capital call was a good thing? It's like a situation you talked about, right? So like it basically it's like, hey, it's gonna save the project. And there's definitely times, like, like you were just mentioning, Kathy, is like, I totally agree with you. It's like, ask why and see what's the underlying reason for the, the need for the more cash, right? So is it just going to need a little bit more development, going to need a little bit more funding, right? So like, okay, that's great. Do it, but prove to me that this deal is not falling through, right? That's that, that, that's what I'd love to ask in that in that opinion. And there are times where it's not. And so it's like, okay, you need a little bit more to get across the finish line. Great. If you, they can't really show you anything, that would be uh, that'd be a red flag in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and the one with the Shasta Wine Village, it was really, he wanted his management fee, so that's what it was, and we're like, absolutely not. <laughs> um, okay, I have a single member California S Corp. What benefit could I get from placing real estate assets in my S Corp? Should I open an LLC instead? This question is for real estate investment, not syndication. Uh, I would I, I would not, I would open a separate LLC, and okay. I would not invest in the S Corporation. Yep, LLCs are perfect for real estate and S Corps are great for business, right? Yes. <laughs> if you have an active business, then you want to S Corp because then you could pay yourself a, a salary and take dividends. A very different deal, but LLCs for real estate. Uh, if President, I mean, this is a very big if and I, who knows, but if President Trump follows through on his tentative plans to eliminate the IRS or possibly eliminate income tax, replace them with tariffs and other sales taxes, 
then none of this matters. <laughs> what are the chances, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say that like we have a less than one percent chance of the income tax yeah. and the IRS getting completely eliminated. So sorry. I, yeah, you're right. It might not matter, but I just, I don't really expect that. Personally. I don't. I, I see would what put I a lot of, I put a lot of money in that. <laughs> Who knows? There's been many a surprise. So sure. <laughs> Um, in terms of the waterfall on our project, it's 12% distributions and a return of capital. Is there also a return on equity upon exit? Sorry. Do you want to go through that um, process of what a preferred return is versus a preferred return isn't necessarily distributions per se, but yeah. You want to explain that, Paul? Yeah, I guess just to be clear how we structure this deal is one, we're returning the adjusted capital back first. So that gets distributed back on every distribution until that reaches zero. Then we calculate what the 12% the preferred return is for the distribute back the preferred return. And then whatever anticipated profits left over, the distribution of profits then occur. And also just to point out, we don't have a waterfall structure. The 50% profit sharing is 50% the entire time. So you might see in other syndication deals uh it's, it starts at 50 percent and goes on to 30 percent if they hit a certain hurdle we keep ours at 50 percent the entire time and there's no um, hurdles changing that percentage yeah um and and there's sometimes confusion about what that 12 percent preferred return is that basically means that during the time that your money is tied up in the syndication your original capital you are earning a 12 percent per year preferred return that as profits come out, you get that first before us managers get our share. So out of this, get your money back first, and then out of this pile of money that comes in later, you get the first 12% based on all the time that your money was tied up per year. Did I explain that well? <laughs> and then after that, after you've got up to 12, then we split 50-50 and that's when we get our share. Um, the person's question, can you exchange into a syndication? Please answer that. You, you, the government requires that you, if you sell a property, you have to buy a like kind property and it has to stay in the same title on the property. So let's say I've got Kathy Fetke LLC and I've, I own this property and I sold it. All of that money can never go in my bank account. It goes into another like kind property under Kathy Fetke LLC, same titling. Um, with a syndication, it, it, the title on the property is um, Wild Pine LLC. That's like the title on it. So that if we were to 1031, it would have to be the entire group. The entire syndication would sell it and Wild Pine LLC would go buy another built to rent situation or community. Uh, so it's very difficult as you as an investor who's bought a security, you've bought a security, you have it, you're not on title on the land. So you can't exchange it. The, the government doesn't allow that. Did I did I explain that okay? Oh, that's perfect, 100%. Not, not a CPA here, but that's the main thing. So always be careful if you have a partnership of any type, a type, you know, if you, if Paul and I just go out and buy a property together and we put it in the LLC that we share 50-50, it's gonna be complicated too. It's always complicated when you bring someone else in. Always. Always. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Kathy mentioned earlier, tenancy in common is one way to like structure around that, but it's the only real way. And there's a lot of legality and a lot of tax requirements if you're going to do something like that that puts additional restrictions on if you want to qualify. It's not, it's not just easy as saying we have a we have a tenancy in common structure. Boom, we're fine. There's a lot more that goes into that. Yeah, and if we can, you know, if if there's enough profit in the deal that it would make sense for us to do that, we'll look at it in the future because people ask us all the time. But I do want to let you know that the offerings that we have at Real Wealth are are pretty passive. They're not as passive as a syndication. But if you if you know work with one of our teams who help you with your 1031, um, it's pretty turnkey, pretty passive. Even though you are in the driver's seat on that, versus investing with us where we just take care of, of it in a in a syndication. What is the first return expected to be received? What is the mortgage rate for the project? Uh, it would be after month 26, so when we start le leasing that first round of um, of duplexes. Um, for the rates that we're using, uh, for the construction loan, we 
underrated at nine and a half, but we already have terms below that. And then for the refinance, uh, we're at about a six um, percent rate right now that we're performing. Uh, but again, that is three years down the road, that, that rate. Let's go to the next slide because we're at an hour already. Can't believe it. Um, if you want more information on our specific, our current syndication, this built to rent community, Kathy McBride and Ann Triplett have been with Real Wealth for years. Um, they will walk you through the process of your first time investor in a syndication. There's a lot of documents that can be daunting and they'll, they'll walk you through it. And invested personally in a bunch of the, the deals so she knows how, uh, what it's like from both sides. Um, they will, again, you could reach them at syndications at realwealth.com. And questions to Anne and Kathy would be really more related to the documents. Questions about the actual project, I would direct those to Paul. He is the one who very meticulously underwrote it. Um, and we asked him to be very conservative, but he already was. <laughs> so um, Paul at realwealth.com is how you'd reach him for specific questions. And then you just go to realwealth.com forward slash wildpine. To, um, to get the documents, to be able to review and see more information. We have uh, our um, webinars and presentations uploaded there too. Okay, well, I think that's it. Nathan, thank you so much. That was wonderful and fascinating. And I, I think you gave just an enormous amount of value. Paul, thank you for always being here and I'll see you tonight at the live event. See you tonight. Thank you, all. thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing your questions and talking to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.